It was a long day. I won't keep you longer. I just wanted to make the connection with yesterday uh, for the ones who weren't there during the workshops, but also to try to see where are the connecting points between what you've been discussing yesterday in the workshops and with all the ideas that we exchanged today. So we had our secret agents in every workshop. Uh, we had our own reporters, and then I would like to ask Neda, Chrisis, and Kiki to share the stage with us and uh, share their key takeaways from yesterday. <laughs> and also Vasilis is a double agent because at the moment he is at the control room and he was responsible for all the screens that were changing here, so he would need a bit of time to come downstairs. Um, that's the spirit. Maybe mainly we need the clapping in the final session before we go outside. Before we start, I just wanted to say how we chose these four workshops, these four thematic dimensions, uh, and why we chose that was the only thing that we did top down. Uh, defining independent living in the way we wanted to discuss it over these days with you guys. The rest it was just for you. Uh, a, a platform to be here and to be the protagonists of the whole thing. And we're really excited how well it worked out. Um, so the four workshops were affordable housing, because I mean, at housing is where everything starts. If you don't have access to decent affordable housing, we extensively discussed it earlier today, then you don't have the basis, you don't have step one for whatever comes next for independent living. If you don't have housing, I mean, you probably don't have housing if you don't have the second workshop. If you have precarious working conditions, if you have minimum income, if you cannot have a decent and independent life, even if you have a job. And if you have these two conditions, then most probably you are led to the third workshop, which is dedicated to mental health. And uh, this increasing trend in the EU and worldwide, especially after the pandemic, uh, with uh, the mental health issues. And if you tick all three boxes, which is very possible, then where is the courage and where are the preconditions to be able to participate in the politics from whatever role. So we really think is a very complicated puzzle. And I think we all came together closer to a, um, an analysis, at least, of the situation on the ground in different European countries. And together, again, we will um, get closer to some proposals and solutions that uh, then we will make sure that reach um, people, hopefully with open ears in Brussels, in Berlin, at local level, in various countries, and so on. Workshop number one, that was housing. Kiki. So, thank you. And really nice to see you again today. So, lack of accessible and affordable housing. We were 20 very energized and tired and also confident and many, many adjectives came up when we discussed our collective identity. 20 persons from across Europe. Um, the highlight of the workshop, I think, was beyond any doubt the reality check round that we did and where everyone shared their personal uh, stories and experiences with housing. So this, in the end, uh, painted a rather bloom picture of the housing uh, crisis happening in various uh, European countries and uh, cities. And um, then came uh, a session with facts and data from the facilitators and the experts that documented these um, real life experiences. Uh, I wouldn't like to go into details about that, just saying that housing is a human right under threat. We already discussed the threats the importance of place and how if you change the streets and neighborhoods, then you can bring sociological uh, changes. And eventually we need to change our lifestyles. And uh, then a number of innovative, uh, affordable housing, living in common models were presented. So the last part was a participatory uh, way, a world cafe to harvest all this collective uh, wisdom that we had in the room. Uh, we discussed why housing is important. 
is uh, a necessity, is, not, is vital in order to be uh, living life, uh, to have freedom and to have uh, human rights. What do we need and we desire? We need uh, housing that is affordable, accessible for all people, especially those facing uh, living with disabilities and facing exclusion. Um, we need sustainable constructions that contribute to a healthy planet and human, human well-being, that they are well connected to the urban fabric, to the landscape, the history and the identity of the place. We need housing that supports community building. We need policies that enable innovative community housing projects. The legal frameworks are missing and we need targeted financial support tools for tenants and owners. And what do we suggest? First of all, an analysis, a, a collaborative research on the needs and solutions um, for uh, housing that is affordable, green, and to the benefit of the common good rather than the private profit. We need to address the housing crisis in a bottom-up approach, engaging with different stakeholders, uh, different social groups. And we came up with a number of more specific proposals, reuse and repurpose of buildings, a social tax for big enterprises, so they will be a given. They will give. They will be given the option of a social credit, where they devote a donation to social housing in their areas. Uh, an EU vacant house rule, so any vacant house that will not be used by the state for X years should be fined, and in this way we put in the state's best interest to use these vacant houses, and a national plan for an existing housing new buildings ratio so that we will encourage the use of existing infrastructure than investing in more urban expansion. That's it. Um, okay, Vasily, the double secret agent. <laughs> Thank you, Kiki. Thank you, Michal, Alexia. Hello. Well, uh, the workshop I will talk to you about uh, was called Empowering Youth for Independent Living, Addressing Working Conditions and Labor Insecurity. And it was, uh, of course, about working conditions and uh, uh, for young people in Europe, uh, the challenges they face and uh, the income problems. Uh, there were 19 participants from Greece, Turkey, Germany, Portugal, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Serbia, Denmark, Belgium, Croatia, and uh, Romania. Uh, forgive me if, uh, if I'm forgetting someone. Uh, well, countries with big differences between them, between them which is uh, certainly very interesting because it seems uh, that uh, despite the cultural differences or differences in legislation uh, between them, the basic problems are the same, even if the causes or the proposed solutions differ. Uh, I, I would first of all like to point out that all participants detected a problem as they admitted that they are not the average uh, European young person, as they are well educated, uh, with many skills, therefore are, uh, they are more likely to find a good job, uh, and this uh, makes them a kind of bubble. Uh, however, I must say that they did not speak only for themselves, but as representatives of uh, their whole generation. Um, uh, they did not only refer to the expected problems, such as unemployment, uh, brain drain, lack of connection between education and job market, but they linked working conditions and uh, problems to a multitude of uh, issues, such as the climate change, the now emerging artificial uh, intelligence, the nepotism, or even the press freedom. Uh, however, the top issues that were repeated most often by mo and by most people were the low uh, wages, the unpaid jobs, the high competition, the difficulty of entering the labor market for the first time, the lack of, of uh, information at all levels, education, training, rights, calls for uh, open calls for recruitment, uh, legislation. And of course, um, they refer to all kinds of inequalities, class inequalities, social, educational, or uh, inequalities between the private and the, and the public sector, uh, or between urban and rural areas. 
Uh, last but not least, a top issue was the lack of strong unions and unionization, uh, which is linked to the dominant feeling uh, that young people are not strong enough to face challenges because they are alone and um, not um, interconnected in strong communities. Uh, the solutions proposed in an action plan uh, were both personal and collective. So uh, what the, individual, the, the individuals are called upon to do is employers to raise wages, uh, to give opportunities and rationalize their demands and expectations. And employees to organize themselves into unions and uh, choose protest as a means of assertion. Other solutions for the people are about uh, promoting dialogue with, within so civil society and of course uh, uh, active participation uh, at various uh, levels. On the other hand, decision makers uh, need to formulate labor policies. Examples include a shorter retirement uh, ages and raising the minimum uh, wage. Uh, they also have to ensure the inclusivity and representation of all age groups uh, at labor market, uh, invest in education, connection and career orientation, uh, promote awareness and transparency of procedures and focus on small and medium sized enterprises, startups, the local economy, decentralization. And finally, uh, to promote a new direction for the economy, the so called post growth. Hello from me too. Um, so I was lucky to follow the workshop on mental health, not only because it rocked, but and the discussions was very, were very interesting, but also because mental health affects all the other topics that we're discussing here today, and it is affected by them. So I think it is something we can look at horizontally too, and something important for all human beings. Our workshop was called Drop in, drops in the ocean, independent, happy, and working together. And I know that the title might sound a bit odd, but I think it's really important to also understand why it was um, named like that. Uh, basically, what we wanted to, for you to take with you uh, was that human beings are not only they are autonomous entities, but they are also uh, very well, very much interconnected. Um, so we are individuals, but we are also a collective, and we should always look at us in both ways. Individuals who belong to a greater group, and we cannot, we can never look at people uh, only as um, units, exactly, thanks. <laughs> uh, and we also played this very nice game with the threads, with the three threads, of, with the three colors. Uh, each thread was representing, um, so the one thread was representing the political, the one was representing the personal, and the third one, uh, the practical. And then we tangled the threads and Basically, what we wanted to, to um, people to remember is that those can never be untangled. Those three things will always go together and they will always affect our mental health. And our mental health will always be affected by internal and external developments. So it is something very complicated. Uh, we started the discussion in and in a not very orthodox way, we started by discussing uh, that the things that posit positively affect our mental health uh, because we didn't want to pathologize mental health. We didn't want to start the discussion, the workshop, by discussing, um, you know, like climate anxiety, as Chris has pointed out before, um, depression. We wanted to give a positive note and uh, we wanted the participants to, to remember that there are things that we can do on many different levels 
that will boost our mental health. Um, and maybe those were actually our proposals too. And I might as well start with those. One thing that we discussed a lot was about the belonging, belonging to community, about social connections and how those are very important for all human beings to maintain a healthy, uh, like to maintain our mental health. We also discuss about the importance of multicultural environments and how those enrich our experiences when we you know, are given the opportunity to, to learn from people coming from different backgrounds. We talked about the work-life balance, which is something I think many of us are, like many young people are striving today uh, on top of trying to uh, you know, make a living. We talked also about the importance of nature and being in close contact with it. We said that uh, it's important to, of course, have like a comfort zone, but also to be able to expand it and make more, fi more things feel like home. Of course, we referred to access to like basic social rights, like healthcare, um, like quality housing, financial security. And then we also, we also thought that it's very important to acknowledge and address also generational and collect collective trauma that people are carrying because it's not just the experiences that we directly have ourselves, but also uh, the, the broader public and um, also the generations before us. And we also thought that it's very important to offer and receive kindness in order to sustain a good mental health. Of course, we concluded the workshop by discussing some proposals, as you all did, and those proposals were discussed on many different levels, starting from the personal to the household level to the community level to the local, the regional, the national, the European, since we're um, based in Europe, and then the global. But of course, it was not easy to put all those like proposal in, proposals in boxes. But then um, maybe some like key takeaways from the discussion in the end um, was of course, were of course like, you know, having community spaces that will feel safe about young people, where they will be able to express themselves openly and uh, feel heard and understood. And we envisage, we envisage those spaces to um, also include like, you know, like um, community kitchens, community gardens, uh, to, to provide like language exchanges, language, uh, community language classes for like people, um, for members of the community. We also talked a lot about education and the importance of education um, in changing like um, established uh, situations. We thought that it is, um, it would make much sense to make radical changes in the, educa in the educational systems uh, so that they don't only serve the job markets, but also the needs of the human beings, of the people, um, to, to like an educational system that would cultivate empathy, um, that would uh, address mental health and the other needs of the young people. And we also said that education is also important um, for destigmatizing public mental health or for, for example, uh, creating more inclusive societies so that everyone can feel safe in those and, yeah, included. And um, we thought that it is important to use media, education and politics to change the public discourse uh, on many different groups like uh, people on the move or people um, or people who define as LGBTQ+, so that we don't have like widespread hate across those, uh, towards those groups. 
um, we discussed about new ways of existing, of working together, living together, and in that sense, we also talked a lot about cooperatives, um, social housing, we touched upon those topics as well. Um, of course, we said that on a personal level, it is important to be conscious of whom we are voting for and make sure that we check out their agendas before we do so. And last but not least, of course, we discussed about the importance of active participation of young people in the commons, so that our voices are being heard uh, and taken into consideration in the policy making procedures. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I have the pleasure of presenting the workshop on democratic or on youth participation. Um, any kind of participation, not limiting anything here, no. Um, I want to be really brief, but it was such a rich and amazing workshop, so now I'm, I'm a bit challenged here, but I know some of us, including myself, will want to get on a boat, so I'm really <laughs> quick. Um, we started with a basis for participation, like what is needed, and of course we identified um, a couple of personal things like motivation and energy and, you know, um, things that, that an individual um, might need. But we were very fast at identifying then issues that are structural. And I must say, as, a, as an observer, what I found fascinating was that um, I did not, unfortunately, look into the uh, countries. Like, we did not really say in the beginning who is coming from where, but I would say uh, along the workshop and the discussions, we had many different examples from many different countries, and it became clear that we were indeed, like, the group was coming from very different countries. Um, and the structural challenges were really, really similar. Um, so I think this was one of the probably one of the key takeaways, um, also for me personally, because obviously a lot of political participation um, avenues and um, and options depend on the specific political system. So we we have different national systems and different uh, municipal systems. So in some cities we identified um, youth councils and others we don't have them. We have different forms of political participation in schools and universities. So all these kind of, um, let's say, avenues are very, very different and very specific to the local context, yet the challenges um, that are there, despite the, let's say, framework, um, seem to be very similar. And I'm naming you a couple of those. Uh, please forgive me if I, um, f if, I, if I can't name them all. But um, I'd say the issue of, and it was mentioned also in the, in the panel discussion, the issue of tokenism. We spoke about this um, ladder um, which Roger Hart in the 90s developed, which, which kind of starts with this like um, non-participation or participation as decoration only um, and, and goes up until um, like, like, like full co-shaping of ideas and, and concepts. And obviously this is never a straight line, right? Like we also discussed how um, th one's position along this like straight um, um, ladder, let's say, might change very rapidly. And also in different contexts, this might change, of course. But this whole aspect of how to really um, have a seat at the table, how to really have a, a piece of power. And what I also found fascinating was we discussed this for obvious um, contexts such as party politics, but it was also brought up yesterday how this matters at the workspace, for instance, how we can have how we can have a participation of young people um, in, in workspaces, in all different forms of, of envi environments in which we all are and live and um, we are part of. So I found this really interesting. We discussed, of course, challenges and obstacles, but also um, the, the things that enable participation and support participation. So the list of challenges was long. Um, I think one of them was funding and money. Um, Olga, you mentioned, for instance, if you run, you, you want to be a candidate for the local level, you, you don't get funding. Like, I mean, this is very hands-on and very crucial. 
We also had a guest um, during our workshop who was a politician from the local level, a municipal politician, um, voted with the age of 20, I'm not sure, four, thank you, um, telling us about very personal experiences um, he had, which was, I think, great. Um, and then I don't want to go into the challenges too much, um, but but we discussed um, chances or positive aspects. Um, and again, networking, safe spaces, exchange, I think is, is key to, to avenues for participation as well. Um, sometimes it's the little steps. Um, you mentioned it in the panel, how, how it can be helpful to really have those, to look at the little steps where we can change something um, while not forgetting the bigger picture, of course, at the same time. Um, and maybe to to close with what we what we did, we did not come up with an action plan in that sense, but we mapped basically um, ways to participate on the different levels. So what we did in the end was to, to have a huge map of um, how can we participate um, and be active on the local level, on the national level and on the EU level. And this collection was, was done um, as a group and will be shared then with everyone. So this already is a w first step to, to kind of counter the lack of, because sometimes we also identify the lack of just information and transparency. Um, so, so we realize knowledge is key. This was also mentioned earlier in the workshop. So to start with basically showing everyone the, the um, options that are there and then empowering hopefully each other to really take upon um, and use those chances. Thank you all very much. And this is our basis for tomorrow. Uh, today is a long day ahead of us and uh, very diverse. But before we go out, I underline the word kindness. So I invite you to raise a wave of kindness to conclude this session and the whole first part of the day. Because I know the European Youth Congress is an amazing organization, opportunity to meet each other, but it's also a freaking tough thing to organize. And if you look on the back of your booklet, you see how many organizations and people it takes to bring together and work many hours, many months in advance so that we are that we can be here and enjoy uh, this opportunity. Uh, so maybe I do the start from this room and uh, I would like to thank the Thessaloniki Film Festival, the Olympian House for hosting us, all these amazing people you see walking around from the catering, the technicians, our photographer, our videographer. So many people who have worked also many days in advance so that we can be here and enjoy this space. I have not only to thank, but also uh, give my respect to this moderator who yesterday was in a war zone and today managed to do all this amazing moderation for so many hours. It couldn't be any better. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being so engaged and so motivated. Thank you, the co-organizers of FIEG and Jeff. Thank you, our local partners, ActionAid and Infinity Greece. Nothing would have been possible without the support of Simvoli in the event management. You all know Elena for sure. You have received many emails from her. <laughs> But you also probably now have met Anna in the back and uh, we thank her with all our heart. And I mean, last but definitely not least, I would like to invite the rest of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung Thessaloniki office team on stage because you see only part of it. Without them, nothing of this would have been possible. You met some of them and another three are there, two were missing. Uh, but for good reason, so... <laughs> and having said that, I really hope, this is a trap I put myself in, when you start thinking, maybe you may forget some people, but I hope I didn't screw up this time. So I really thank you all, and I hope we can enjoy the rest of the day all together as a group in the different opportunities we will have, and also to party together, because, I mean, it's a, an essential part. Thanks again, everyone. See you around.